the fourth and final panel here, which is uh, Lessons Learned and Next Steps to Advance the Science. And we've asked uh, Greg Barroza to uh, take on a, the challenging task of kind of summarizing uh, this meeting and kind of in the context of what's happening uh, overall in the field. Yeah. So, so, and that, that will lead to a stimulating discussion, hopefully, at the end of that. And at yeah, 4 30, we need to end sharply because <laughs> Greg has to depart. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Bill. Yeah, so I, I've been uh, sort of dynamically uh, uh, modifying my talk to conform to the topics that have uh, come up that I'd kind of like to revisit, and I have to apologize in advance, I'm going to revisit it entirely with work from my own research group, but you can do the mapping easily enough to uh, uh, other to your research group or things that are not um, seismology. So um, how do I navigate this thing? No. Oh, you click. Okay. So uh, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that um, we're, we're going to have to deal in the very near future with very large data volumes. This is from uh, Kong et al's uh, paper from uh, a, a year ago uh, showing that there's uh, something like half a petabyte of data in the IRIS uh, archives, but um, the data volumes are going to grow uh, really uh, very rapidly. So a single DOS experiment, for example, a fiber optic experiment running for several months, just a single fiber uh, can generate, uh, j again, as much uh, data. And we have to ask the question, how are we going to process this data? We certainly need some kind of, uh, we need scalable algorithms that can work with and, and extract information from large data sets. Can we move this much data around? Does it make sense to try? These are uh, challenges that we're going to have to face basically right now. Uh, just in the last talk, the notion of legacy uh, data came up. So uh, computer scientists sometimes call data that's hard to use or is not used as inaccessible as dark data. Seismology has a lot of it. So over uh, there's uh, instrumental seismology started in the, the late 19th century. So for most of our uh, most of our data measured by time is uh, analog, and, and digital didn't become the standard until uh, say the 1990s. So we have a lot of old, important data that's perishable, and uh, we have to figure out how to deal with it. And I, I gather that the, this committee had a meeting, convened a meeting, a, a workshop a, a month or two ago that I couldn't go to. Uh, but uh, one of our students has been working on using not the vector seismograms, but images of seismograms. This is film data that is scanned, and uh, she has figured out how to extract, basically use that as the data and extract, for example, arrival time data, and uh, it, it avoids the need to do the difficult vectorization that you can imagine trying to follow that trace. Uh, it's not easy to do. Um, and you can extract the same sort of information that we use for precision uh, seismology. And this is looking back now 50 years at the Rangeley earthquake control experiment. It's an experiment we can't do right now for uh, um, various uh, reasons having to do with liability, uh, but but it was, it's a very important uh, experiment in the history of earthquake science, and we can go back to it with modern techniques and get a, a clear look. We're detecting more earthquakes. It's going to get much better than this. This project is kind of a weird pastiche of analog data and, and machine learning, which is what we're using for, uh, uh, for this. So there's some real opportunities applying machine learning to, to legacy data sets. One of the issues that's come up is how to sort of broaden the impact of uh, AI, machine learning, or data science uh, throughout the geosciences. I'm, I'm a seismologist and I study earthquakes, so uh, my, uh, my approach to trying to do this is to get other people in sort of the, the earthquake science near field looking at LIDAR data or uh, GNSS data or INSAR or simulation output to get them interested in, uh, in seeing how, uh, get them motivated by seeing how much of a difference it makes in, in seismology. But there are no doubt other approaches to, uh, uh, to broadening the reach of data science. So uh, one of the issues that came up was how to choose the right approach. Um, we've, we have a lot of experience with this and, you know, we're slow enough at doing our science that, uh, the, the right approach is kind of a moving target. So you have to do what you can to stay abreast of the field and that sort of, uh, that tends to motivate one to be uh, closely connected to real data scientists who do this 
sort of thing uh, full time. But just as examples, um, we use this uh, data mining uh, algorithm, uses locality sensitive hashing. Clara Yoon, who's on the call at least earlier, um, uh, sort of uh, that was the core of her thesis and, and, and aspects of the Carrie Ann's thesis as well. That's an unsupervised method. It exploits the similarity in unlabeled uh, data sets. So it's, um, it's a, a data mining technique. For other applications like uh, earthquake detection, denoising, phase picking, we use labeled data. So we, that's, those are supervised methods. Oops. And uh, for, for some uh, classification, reducing dimensionality using uh, deep auto encoders can, as we saw earlier today, can be quite helpful. So uh, Zach uh, talked about this uh, deep denoising uh, algorithm. So that's, a, that's an algorithm. It's a, it's a very deep uh, neural network that, that learns to separate signal <clears throat> from noise by, <clears throat> excuse me, learning both uh, the signature of signals and noise. So we work in the frequency domain. Uh, small local earthquakes are, are initially broadband and they decay in a frequency dependent way with time. This uh, deep denoiser learns the, the characteristics of the signal and the noise, <clears throat> just applies a simple mask to try to separate uh, the two. And it, you know, for the, the, the data that's like the data we've trained it with, it works quite well. So this just shows an example. We have the clean signal at the top. Second panel shows noise. So these are recorded independently. We do a superposition. So in this case, we know ground truth. We know the signal we want to get back, thanks. And um, <clears throat> we see how well we recover it. And so here we recover it pretty well. The inset panel shows in detail uh, the, the, the waveform at the initial part, which is what we usually use to measure the arrival time. And the recovered noise is at the bottom. And if you look closely, you can see that the the noise sort of uh, necks down to lower amplitude. There's clearly some crosstalk between the two, but this is a much better method than simple filtering or something like that, which is a very crude uh, instrument. It doesn't use the time-dependent character and frequency-dependent character of these um, signals to do the denoising. And this has a lot of potential applications because all of our data is noisy. And the data, it's probably most helpful for the data that's the noisiest. So, urban seismic monitoring, uh, seafloor seismic monitoring, monitoring near volcanoes. Um, <clears throat> those are all applications where this, I think, has a lot of potential. And sometimes we want to get rid of the earthquake signals. So we can we could do designaling if we want to do ambient field uh, correlations, for example. OK, Zach showed uh, this uh, histogram of the, the neural net based P and S picks versus sort of the, the, the standard uh, approach and and you can see that it doesn't do that much better with the p wave it does dramatically better though with the s wave but the important thing is, the one thing i wanted to emphasize here is that this is compared with reviewed picks which are somehow taken as correct well they're not necessarily correct um and this brings up a, the question that's come up in a couple of the talks of how do we uh, navigate ground truth ground truth is kind of squishy if we don't know uh, what the answer is supposed to be so just to illustrate that with some examples, here's an example of a bad pick in the catalog. So here is, this is the, the, the phase net, whoops, the phase net output showing the peak of probability and hence the P wave pick right around here. But in the catalog, it's, it's removed from the waveform. Whereas uh, here's a really bad S pick. And the, these sorts of errors are in there and they contribute to the dispersion unfairly, I would say, they contributed to the dispersion in these, uh, these measures of performance. But we don't really know what the ground truth so how is, so how, how might we get there? So we, one thing we could do is test the self-consistency of the data. So here's a small uh, earthquake cluster from earthquake sequence in Italy, so very much independent data. Uh, we make 50,000 picks with phase net, uh, sort of standard approach, we make about half as many. And FaceNet has larger residuals, but because it can pick so many S waves, we get what we think are better results. So this is a rotated view of the relocations. These are HypoDD relocations. Um, <clears throat> the uh, standard picks are on the left. The FaceNet picks are on the right. 
our prejudice, mm -hmm. our bias, is that earthquakes happen due to slip on faults. And so the, the fact that the, the one on the, the right looks more piecewise planar satisfies our intuition. And, and maybe it's not proof, but it, it suggests that, that we're actually getting better uh, picks. We're closer to ground truth. So that's one way uh, we can get at it. Another way is if we have independent information. So I'm going to show a few slides from the Guy Greenbrier sequence. This was happened in uh, central Arkansas. That's shown here in um, the inset. Uh, the gray are the eventual earthquakes in this sequence as, uh, as they appear in the USGS Comcat catalog. Here we see 75 earthquakes in the summer of 2010. They're color coded by depth or the, the, the circles there. There's 75 of them. So we use this uh, data mining method FAST that does similarity search. So nearby earthquakes have similar signals. And without assuming what the form of those signals is, we can um, just uh, uh, we can fingerprint or come up with a compact representation of all those signals that's diagnostic, search that efficiently using a set-based similarity measure, and come up with uh, lots of uh, small repeating signals, almost all of which are earthquakes. So here's so we go from 75 earthquakes to 14,000 earthquakes. So just like uh, Zach was talking about, we 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 reduce the detection uh, threshold substantially. We get many more detections and it illuminates new processes. So I'm going to uh, focus in on this cluster uh, here, what we call cluster one. And that was not what we were looking for. We were expecting these earthquakes to be due to deep injection, but in fact, these were due to hydraulic fracturing. So what's shown here are two uh, production wells, which were stimulated from their so they, they go down and then they go laterally like this, and they were simulated with hydraulic with individual stages that went from the toe of the lateral back to the heel, back towards the well. And uh, you will see these rectangles will indicate the, when the stages were active, and the circles will, will indicate the earthquakes. And you can see that the earthquakes follow the a hydraulic simulation, the individual stages, they follow them around. So this suggests strongly that we're seeing linked processes and, and, it, <clears throat> and that our detections and locations are reliable. So it's a form of uh, ground truth, if you like. And it keeps going and going. <clears throat> Each of those simulations at the same time? Pardon me? Each of those stimulations. I doubt it, but I, I, don't, I don't know how they decide how long to. Uh, in structure yeah. in the there was structure in the earthquakes that are being generated. So the question is, is that structure because of the, the environment? Is that the rock structure or is that due to the stimulations? That's what I was trying to get. Yeah, so it's a good question. I don't know the answer, but I, I will say that th there's some things in here that would uh, sort of are, are not desirable. So when they're stimulating over here, they're triggering earthquakes over here. That means those well, there's connectivity between those two regions and you, they usually try to keep it, they try to manage that. So if they were doing this in real time, monitoring in real time, they might adjust uh, the volumes or the pressures to avoid that happening. But I, I, I don't know the answer to your question. <clears throat> okay, another uh, question that came up uh, several times was, uh, the notion of generalization. So we're going to look at the same Guy Greenbrier sequence. Um, rather than using template matching, which is where you know what your signal is a priori and you look for it in continuous data, or this uninformed data mining method where you, where you just look for repeating signals, now we're going to try to generalize that to something that's more permissive, just finding signals with similar characteristics to previously cataloged earthquakes, and we use machine learning for that. Okay, so this is a, a machine learning based catalog using this phase net neural network. It's not particularly uh, deep. Uh, neural network was deep enough, and it's, it's trained to pick P and S waves and to, and to peak their probability at the P wave and the S wave arrival times. The data that we use to train that network is all from Northern California. It's all, uh, it's mostly short period uh, sensors. The earthquakes 
range in distance up to about 100 or 150 kilometers. They're mostly five kilometers or deeper in depth, and they're mostly small, but not really tiny. They're like magnitude one to, to three. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, that's what it's trained on. We apply it to induced seismicity here in Guy Greenbrier, Arkansas. The earthquakes are smaller. They're mostly magnitude one or smaller. They're shallower. The geologic structure is different, and it works quite well. So this, this supports uh, Zach's uh, assertion this morning that these phase pickers uh, do quite well at picking arrival times, even when you use them at different areas. By the way, we didn't retrain it when we applied it to Italy either. So we find something like 90,000 events. Uh, most of them are, are shown in gray here. The ones that are associated with uh, hydraulic stimulation are shown in uh, a color. And we see, uh, we see evidence for both of those processes as being uh, important for triggering earthquakes. So, this is a comparison of our results on the right. So Park et al. He's a graduate student, third year graduate student. Um, and on the left is a, a Steve Horton, a seismologist who looked at this sequence and plotted the larger events. He had uh, uh, a little under 1,300 events. We've got about 90,000. So, uh, and he, he had a grad student, Paul Aguari, who worked through most of the sequence uh, and found some of the same structures that we're finding, uh, but he didn't go all the way through the sequence, and so um, he didn't get as, as, as full of view as, as, as we get. He had something like 17,000 earthquakes, so a monumental amount of work. He was picking those uh, phases, but with machine learning, we can do that automatically. We really didn't even have to look at the data. Okay, and the interesting thing is that it reveals uh, some processes that were not uh, previously appreciated. So this, this is three sequential uh, episodes in, in time going from left to right. So from July 2010 at the top to, uh, in the lower right, October 2011. And so the, 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 the sequence started in the summer of uh, 2010, and I uh, got, act, got quite active again in uh, early uh, 2011, and there was a magnitude 4.6 earthquake, which led them to shut the deep disposal wells, and the, the, the sequence gradually died out. But you can see within there, there's all those arcuate structures. Those are basically aftershock sequences that look like they're showing some kind of diffusion away from uh, where they occur, whether it's fluid or stress that's diffusing, it's illuminating a process that was otherwise um, invisible before we had all these uh, earthquakes. And we can look at this in cross section. So this is looking at a cross section that goes from this side to this end to that end, so sort of north to south. And uh, here are the initial uh, earthquakes shown until I think February into the, the initial part of that uh, cluster, they're, they're near well one and well five. And then this is something that was not appreciated before. The, 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 the ones in February nucleated sort of independently. And so the, the sequence jumped ahead of itself or nucleated independently and then ruptured back towards where it had been rupturing previously. So that perhaps implicates well two and there's actually a cross fault, the Ender's fault that Goes uh, goes from in this injection well towards where that uh, that earthquake event that earthquake sequence eventually reinitiated in the southern part. So this is something new that we didn't know about beforehand and was illuminated by uh, by all these locations. Okay, another important thing that came up, although only briefly, was how we quantify uh, uncertainty. So for phase net output, where we're classifying probabilistically whether something's P waves or S wave and noise in a time series, we get some width to the distribution and it's tempting to map that into uncertainty, but it's also wrong. That's not a measure of uh, uncertainty in your observation. As uh, Carrie Ann and others mentioned, there are approaches like dropout that are being used to try to characterize in a sort of a bootstrappy way uh, the uncertainty in uh, in, in the output of these uh, uh, deep neural nets. So data sets and, and data uh, challenges. 
<clears throat> so a couple people have talked about the need for curated data sets and, and benchmark, uh, benchmarks. Um, we've put together a earthquake data set that we call STED or Stanford Earthquake Data Set. This is getting data from the IRIS uh, archives from around the world, uh, from small local earthquakes, 500,000 of them, also samples of noise. And this shows the distribution of seismometers, two and a half thousand of them, epicentral distances. And we've added, uh, we've done a whole lot of quality control. We spent basically a year on that. Um, it's both signals and noise. And we added lots of additional labels that weren't in the original data set. And we published it in a journal that I had never heard of called uh, IEEE Access. And we did that deliberately because we don't, we, we figure that the seismologists are going to find this. Uh, but, but we want the people we really want to find this are the data scientists. So we published this in a data science friendly format. The paper is kind of funny because it, you know, it has, you know, what is a magnitude scale? It has a lot of introductory seismology in it. That's not for you. That's for the data uh, scientists who might be reading it. And the whole idea is to, to recruit the interest of uh, those people in our problems, which I think would be great for all of us. Another way to recruit interest is through these data uh, <coughs> science challenges. So you may have heard of the Seismo Olympics. This was to try to, to, to de develop algorithms for phase picking for the 2008 Wenchuan aftershock sequence. There was $50,000 in prize money. I, I found out about this uh, competition late. Um, I, I told my grad students, don't bother participating in this. They ignored me. And so this, this is highly motivating, apparently. Uh, and it was actually a, a, a good thing for them to get involved. But look at there. So there's 1,100 teams involved, over 4,000 participants in this. There probably aren't that many seismologists in the world. A lot of the people doing this were uh, electrical engineers and computer scientists and so forth. It was great. Great to get that interest. Good for us. Good for our visibility. And also, hopefully, good for... Uh, the field. Now, the ground truth is based on CEA analysts. It, it, it would be interesting to, to come up with a, a, a different measure of ground truth that more is more accurately portrays what we think is, is really the, the truth. Um, that's a good challenge for us. Another uh, question? Who won? Uh, I don't know, but 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 one of the uh, it was it was a group at. Uh, um, no, it was not at Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech was deeply involved. There was a group at, uh, not Beijing, but USCC. There, there, there's a lot of uh, seismologists there, and a lot of seismologists working with electrical engineers and data scientists there. And I think it was a group of computer scientists that won, and I think they were using some STA, LTA kind of algorithm. <laughs> but again, but, but again they, but remember what the ground truth was, right? So, so I think we can do better. I should also say that to collect the prize money, you had to explain your algorithm in Chinese. So, it was, like, <laughs> so, so Greg, highly, but, uh, highly but, motivated to have Chinese participants in, in every team as we did. But so, Greg, so what was the outcome of that? I mean, what's so that's great, but what what was the you know what was the follow up? Yeah, well, what what did we learn? What was the benefit of of this? I, I don't know, but let me let me show another data data challenge that well for me the benefit was my students got highly motivated to do more uh, machine learning and I, so I, I I derived great benefit from that. I didn't win any money, but uh, they did all the work, so they would have won it anyway. Um, I I think. That was a useful exercise, but I think it could be more useful. And let me illustrate that with another example. So this is the Lanol earthquake prediction experiment. And by the way, it's surprising to me that there aren't hundreds of people around the world claiming they can predict earthquakes uh, using uh, machine learning. The combination of the, the low uh, entry threshold and the black box nature of it would seem to be inviting, uh, and yet it hasn't really happened. Anyway. So this, uh, so the notion here, these are laboratory earthquakes, not real earthquakes, and they're in a very clean system, you know, a, a glass bead failure system. And this was a, a, a project that was, we ran last year, it ended last June or July, um, but four and a half thousand teams uh, participated. It was uh, run on uh, Kegel, and uh, Los Alamos, they sort of uh, set up the experiment 
Penn State was involved. That's where the laboratory work was done. Uh, um, Laura Pyrak Nolte, who's at Purdue, uh, convened a meeting under DOE sponsorship to uh, to think about how to do this sort of thing. And the Department of Energy uh, sponsored the um, sponsored the uh, the data science challenge. And uh, so the results are in some team named Zoo, uh, Z O O uh, one. And there's an article online about what they did and why they did it and how, and how it worked. So, to Richard, to your question, this is a better way to do this kind of a challenge with real uh, feedback uh, into the system. Okay, so I'll just stop with these uh, uh, recommendations. This is from Carrie Ann's uh, paper from earlier this year. Um, I, I think it's important to, a lot of these things are uh, important and um, I guess a, a concern I have is that we, we we make sure that the kind of work that gets done under the geo solid earth geoscience rubric in machine learning is credible and that we follow uh, best practices. So I'll stop with that and take questions or maybe we have the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Greg. I think, yeah, let's go right to the panel discussion. Uh, that can include questions on specific things you presented, but, uh, and we do have to end, I guess, at 4.30 so that uh, Greg can depart. So let's open it up. Yeah, this is your, Greg, you're welcome to sit down. You don't have to stand. <laughs> I guess I'll ask a question about, um, you know, your denoising work is, is uh, really nice and stimulating, and I guess it, it raises a question that hasn't come up yet as an application, which is uh, quality control. Since a big part of uh, machine learning depends upon putting together a, a good, clean data set to, uh, to train things on, it seems like the first thing you would want to do is use machine learning to kind of build your data set and to get rid of things that are you know, not real. And I know, you know, in, in geophysics, we have, we don't need people to do attacks on it. We, we, our data attacks itself. We have dropouts, we have leap seconds, we have, you know, nonlinear response. We have countless problems in, in data. Uh, and it seems like the first thing you want to do is clean that up. And, uh, and I'm kind of surprised nobody really talked about that, but that seems like low hanging fruit for, uh, for machine learning. And I wonder if you want to comment on that. Yeah. So, um, like, yeah. Yeah, so, so the denoising um, algorithm, you, you may have noticed there are many, it's a very deep net, there are many trainable parameters. Um, and it, it was trained on data from Northern California, and that data tends to be recorded in quiet places that are picked because they're quiet, they're on bedrock and whatnot. So I w would not necessarily expect it to generalize well to the seafloor or to an urban environment because you'll have a, a rich set of noise sources that may, you know, may not be separately recognized by that, um, uh, by that algorithm uh, its current implementation. So I, I, the generalization has yet to be demonstrated for, for that instance. I mean, I'm sure it would work well for the Northern California data it was trained on or, you know, going forward with that kind of data, but more uh, beyond that, it's uh, uncertain. D did that answer your question or not? It sort of, uh, sort of did, but um, I... it doesn't necessarily have to be generalized, I guess. It's sort of maybe like a set of rules that you would want to apply uh, to your data before you, to your training set before you started, and, and maybe you have to do that for each data set separately if you're if you're trying to basically screen out things that are outliers. Yeah, so so okay. So so there's into that training go go both so I didn't get into any of this, but into that, that training go both signals and noise. And so the signals we know earthquakes, we know that for say phase picking that that generalizes quite well. And and so I I think you could do something like if you had local uh, noise issues like irrigation systems or whatever, you could um, you could retrain it with 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 that as sort of an overlay, so it, it would work uh, work better. 
Okay. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And thanks. And I guess let me remind everyone, too, that this is now the general discussion, so people are free to ask questions to any of the previous speakers, uh, and anyone is uh, is invited to uh, step in and answer if they feel they have a, a good answer or a good discussion point. So oh, let's just, open this up. I just want to add for, to your question. Um, I don't. I haven't looked at the papers recently, but in our review paper, there were a few examples of seismic data where they were using machine learning for data cleaning. Um, I, I haven't looked at the papers recently, so I can't tell you a lot of details, but if you look in there, there are a few references. So it is something that people have used um, machine learning to try to approach. Um, and I think those papers were from um, a little, they were some of the ones that were a little bit earlier, so like maybe um, like early 2010. So they were before everyone sort of jumped on the machine learning bandwagon, there was some work. Yep. Even then on that. Topic. If I could add to that, for some reason, those are all in the exploration seismology, almost all in, in, in that field. That They were sort of into it before we were. That's also been the driver for a lot of outlier detection methods in machine learning is finding examples in a data set that uh, are, are, should not be in that data set or should be removed from the training. Yeah, that makes sense given the volumes of data you're talking about dealing with. I mean, there's no way to humanly review that, so. Other questions or discussion points, Thorson? So, Greg, do you want to comment a little bit more on this earthquake prediction thing? What did we learn from that? I was just reading the zoo thing, and they're like, yay, we threw everything in the kitchen sink, and it's like some neural networks, some this, some this. And, and, and they, added, they added noise to it. So I didn't yeah. participate in that, ch in, in that challenge at all. I, I mean, I was at the meeting, and we talked about it, but we didn't, we didn't do anything. So I, I'm not the one to, to comment on how useful that is. I, you know, I just noted that there was follow-up that where the, the, com the broader community got feedback about what worked and some speculation, if I recall correctly, about why it helped. Um, but beyond that, I, I wouldn't be able to give you guidance. I, I think it would be useful to, to think about how, you know, setting up another challenge and, and, and thinking up front about how to make it most useful. I think that sort of approach of like throwing a lot of methods together, that's, that's worked for a lot of other um, challenges of these kind of, like the Netflix prize, for instance, they, that one, um, the final solution was sort of an ensemble of methods. Um, so I think that's kind of common that kind of, you know, throwing everything at it all at once um, gives good solutions. Um, these ensemble approaches tend to work well, I think, for a lot of problems. I can't resist but point out that 50K is an incredibly cost-effective way for NSF to spend some money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am curious about this, right? So there, it's 50K and there were how many? There were over 1,100 entries. I, I'm just, you know, you, you're funding, your chances of getting NSF funding are much higher than that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm curious as a motivator that that's the... Uh... Yeah, so, uh, so there were over 5,000 entrants and 50. So, so the expected value of your winnings is... But I think that Slight. includes people who just made accounts and never submitted anything, right? That's not necessarily submissions over 5,000. So there were more submit, there were 5,000 teams. Right. And there were more, many more submissions than teams. Interesting. So obviously people were good at multiple entries. And, and I, I don't know who all these people are, but at one point, I didn't check it at the end, but before the end, it was, you know, some dude in his garage was was in first place. <laughs> it's interesting sociology. But, but I mean, all of this, right? You have a combination of methods, and then you add noise. It's sort of like a like the randomness sort of seems like you know, some method is going to win, sure, right? But what's how does this? How do you generalize from that? I mean, so the difference between the winning entry and the second place entry was very small. It was a very it, it was a, a small margin. It's this. The list is on there, and all the prizes didn't go to the winner. It was no, no. Like, what I mean is, what is the difference in method between the first and the second approach, right? Are those similar methods? So they have the similar mix between so, looking at quartiles and a neural network. Is it? I mean, so if, if there's some reality to that, they should be similar mixes, right? Otherwise, it's pure luck. Possibly, yeah. So, so speaking of luck, when I was six, I won a bicycle in the, 
and uh, and, and I went with a friend to a fair, and and, and she it was her or whatever it was her father's. Anyway, that's the only time I ever won a prize. So instead, <laughs> what I thought I'd do is <laughs> is change the subject and get leave fr prizes and go back to talking about the a couple of the examples even and you know I I'm gonna come back and ask Zach too is what are you know, Greg or Zach um, or anyone um, you know it, you you've shown some. Some examples of fluid-induced earthquakes and and then tectonic faults. So you have a mix of sources and a mix of, or potentially a mix of signals within these data sets. Since you're talking about locations, you're showing locations as if the location is the prize, but instead the end goal is to to also then look at at the time space sequence and understand process. And so I guess what I wanted to get back to then is. Um, examples of fluid-induced earthquakes um, or induced uh, volcanic earthquakes and others in, in a, the massive problem of S, detecting S waves or, or whether or not there are secondary waves at all and how we can um, improve our understanding of fluid-involved faulting processes through these machine learning. Do you have some insights as well? Um, so you want to know about S wave picking uh, just, performance? Just even or? no. Well, S wave p picking performance in a bit more nitty gritty yeah. and success in the range of types of earthquake sets because we we've seen success in terms of a map fault or a cluster, you know, the the clustering or improved clustering. But then there are also changes in waveforms and changes in types, and there's additional waves that we could besides the spatial locations or time space, but we could understand different sources. How, how far away are we from? Um, I mean, I've, I've spent most of the last kind of year and a half or two focused on just getting to the point where we can build these seismicity catalogs. And, and so I think, you know, going forward is really when the, all the analysis is going to get done. So I, I don't have too much insight into um, kind of all these specific uh, science applications just yet. We're close to doable. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and I, I think that because we're looking forward, we're we're taking where we are now and moving, or you know, thinking forward and informing forward, and just trying to move the conversation in that direction as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's we have capabilities now that we just couldn't do before with this kind of level of convenience, I would say, and and the performance is just it's outstanding. Um, uh, I think the applications going forward are going to be very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, so it's actually kind of a follow-up to this. I was struck by one um, thing you said in your talk, which was, um, you know, a lot of S-wave picks. So the the analysts were not confident about the S-wave picks. The machine obviously was. So I mean, were the analysts underconfident? Were the machines overconfident? And, and do you have? Um, it may be too early to to fully answer that, but do you have a sense in these cases where? Um, yeah, I mean, are the machines getting their confidence level right in in particular in these more difficult to pick uh, and difficult to identify uh, uh, signals? Um, I mean, it's it's hard to assess because we don't really have, as we discussed before, we don't have really a good way of evaluating um, confidence. I guess, you could, I guess you could you could look at residuals and location to see sure. whether they are systematically better or worse, and something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, but then again, I mean, this is just all model, and you can always kind of map it into unknown structure and things like that too. So it's not it's not exactly clear. I mean, uh, as you get to the really low SNR conditions, it, it starts getting really hard to to try to um, to talk about what the errors are, obviously. Um, but I think the fact that we're even discussing this in the first place is, is really kind of a, a different take on this altogether, right? Whereas with these STLTA picks from before, you're looking at not picking anything less than SNR5, right? So now we're here we are talking about whether or not these picks are good enough at SNR of one. Um, so that's a totally different discussion, and I, I mean, I'm happy to have it. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Oh, right. Yeah, just a follow-up comment. So I think what the machine is good at is to 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 see information that's distributed, that's diluted over a number of scales. You know, as humans, we can only see 
information when it's sharp. But if for some reason, you know, you distribute this information over many different scales, we don't see it anymore, but the machine has no, no problem detecting this. Can I follow up on that? Um, so, and also one of the aspects about this that I think is so exciting is that the, you know, humans can't deal well with the dimensionality, right? We can't look at um, even four dimensions easily. So what do we do? We plot seismograms north, east, and vertical side by side, and then try to jump between them and make connections because we can't visualize the full 4D particle motion, right? Um, but these types of systems live naturally in high dimensional spaces. So um, that kind of offers a lot of promise, I, I think. So I wanted to go back to the question of discovery, and Chinkai had a cool plot in his talk that showed basically solving for the parameters in like a dash pot spring model. And what I was wondering was, but what if you didn't know that you had a dash pot and a spring in, in parallel, and instead you had another one in, in serial, or you had some different configuration? Could you use these algorithms to actually figure out what that configuration was, or do you have to guess your model a priori and then try to fit the parameters? Yeah, I think that's, to me, I think it, right now it's still really hard. Like a, a lot of the times we see the, like the observations and we see the inputs into the model, outputs into the model. So basically you try to encode, like encode the whole process, but then, to really condense into like the the real concept, like what's the parameters are really useful. That's a still a long. I think that's still like a, needs a lot of efforts. Like the example I showed in that paper, like um, I think uh, that 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 spring mesh like a system. So they basically it's a toy. It's basically a toy problem that they want to see like how you can actually use machine learning to get the equation or to get at least like some insights. So, and also like they, they kind of like know like how many of the parameters that are really useful. So they actually like they, they, they are looking for these like uh, this set of parameters. I think there's a lot of uh, pre, uh, a lot of like work needs to do that like if something can fully understand like if we have a lot of for example we may don't have like the capability to visualize like that's the one spring system but then you have a lot of these neurons in the like uh, neurons in the uh, neural network and then after you treat you analyze the neurons like cluster them you may find that they they may cluster into like a maybe three core different groups or like uh, certain groups that may be uh, attributed to this, um, this true system. So that's my, my take on the, on the paper. And also, can I just a quick comment back to the to the competition? I think that's uh, the recently there's a lot of this competition starts in our field as well. If you, I, I think uh, Hannah gave a really nice talk about remote sensing. There's actually a one going on right now called the X View data. Basically, this year's uh, this year's theme is like a try to use this remote sensing uh, the data for disaster detection, disaster building, damage detection, and so on. So, but, but if you look at a lot of the winners from Kaggle and also like Carrie mentioned that like the, the Netflix, uh, uh, like one million price. So the, the winner got like the highest uh, um, accuracy, but you actually not, this model cannot be used in other, uh, other situations. It's so tuned, like so manipulated for this task, for this data set. I think uh, Hannah also mentioned that like when we build the uh, benchmark data sets for people to build the model to test like the score and on, on these things. So we need to be careful, like uh, the usefulness of the model, like built against this competition and also like the practice, pra uh, the, the practical usage. I think it's also one thing that we need to add into the, 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 like the metrics, evaluation metrics, instead of like just the, like the accuracy or the correctness. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it seems like we, if we were going to run a competition or if NSF or a funding agency was going to run a competition, why not make the, the goal uh, physical understanding instead of accuracy or something that is potentially more useful? 
uh, coming out of it, not you know, more generalizable. Yeah, I think to that point it is important when we are using machine learning for scientific applications to think about what evaluation metrics make the most sense for that given application. It might not be accuracy, it might be false positives, or it might be like minimizing a false negative rate or something like that. Um, but to add to the point about uh, benchmark data sets, there's, this is, like I mentioned, a huge problem in machine learning too where uh, people have shown that there have been, you know, there's like a huge, after one model will come out, like a GAN, for example, there's then a huge wave of modifications to that architecture that claim uh, marginally better performance usually. And then there are often are later papers that will show that uh, those were not due to any architectural reason or uh, some intrinsic property of the model, but it's the setting of the hyperparameters. And um, so there's a big emphasis in machine learning, too, on doing ablation studies when you present a method to ensure that, uh, to actually tease out what it, what it is about the model or um, the way you trained it or something like that, uh, that actually got you that performance gain. So, oh, can I make, to, to your point, and is it the same or do you have? Okay, so I mean, to Hannah's comment, I mean, and coming back to these examples of the two competitions, so so were the various approaches made openly available? So could somebody theoretically go and look at these different approaches, understand kind of what the differences were, and try and actually extract some of this understanding if they if they wanted to? I don't know how these are set up. Does anybody know? I don't know, but I think some of them were open and some of them were not. I think it was a mix. Oh, just one more thing um, I was going to say about benchmarks, which is I think the the problem of benchmarks was talking about the limitations of them. Um, I think we need to have benchmarks, but I think the benchmarks, as, as you were saying, you have to think about the metrics because since we don't actually know the ground truth, when we create a benchmark, we say this is our ground truth now, and we don't want to optimize to it when it may not be correct, right? It represents what we know now, but if we over sort of this over reliance on benchmarks really gets at, at a point where we might be sort of hurting ourselves in terms of discovery um, because since we don't actually know the ground truth so it's, I think this idea of like not over optimizing for accuracy on benchmarks um, is important it is important to have benchmarks because otherwise everyone's just kind of throwing methods out there and it's really hard to say like how do these actually compare if everyone's just scoring themselves so you want to have something um, some basic baseline that methods should should um, Neat, but I think that, that we have to be careful about how we design the benchmarks and how we measure um, and score against them. But in publishing, oh, sorry. publishing executable code and um, publicly available code can also help with that um, by having that available. If I'm presenting a method for one particular problem and data set that maybe hasn't been open already or is not a benchmark data set, I can then actually use you know your model that you published to test against mine, and that kind of meets both criteria without overemphasizing benchmarks. So I have a, a kind of related question about um, errors for Greg. Um, I mean, you showed these beautiful plots of, of earthquakes that were sort of cloudish and then zooming in on, on the fault, and it seems like a similar transformation from when we started using double difference methods. Um, is, there, is there anything in the uh, algorithm or the method that would somehow bias it to come in on a fault and assuming not, I mean, to come in on a plane and assuming not, do you have a sense of the errors and how much this is improving? Um, well, we used HypoDD to do those relocations. And and so, uh, so there, there, the there are two things. Well, with I showed a couple of things. So with the Apennines, we were using the phase net picks. Right. And because those were piecewise planar, there's nothing I can think of in, in, the, in the data themselves and, and the way we process the data would make them want to be planar like that. Okay. Um, in the Guy Greenbrier case, we actually remeasured, once we detected the events, we remeasured the arrival times using cross correlation where we could and and use hypodd to relocate them so that's why they look right. so extremely sharp but but so do you have a sense of how much those new picks are improving the the locations so the, the but the the new picks are we're use, using to find the earthquakes and then we repick after that to get the precise locations okay 
right? Does, does that make sense? Yes. I'm just trying to, but I'm trying to get a sense of, of what's the overall improvement now in, in from just using the old picks with double difference to the new picks with double difference. I can't. It, it, it's, it, I mean, it looked from the examples you saw, like it really shrunk down to an even finer scale fault structure. I So I don't have, so I haven't compared the, the phase net picks relocated by HypoDD with mm -hmm. the Cross correlation based picks. That would be that would answer your question, I think. But I don't I don't have that answer. So a lot of talks are focusing on interpolation and then so I was just wondering for extrapolation, is that something machine learning will never be able to achieve or is something the community can move forward and perhaps one day can be able to do that? Any of our speakers is invited to respond to that question. All right, I'll bite it. it so it's it's going to be. I don't think it's hard to generalize. I, I wouldn't say never, and it, and it's going to depend. It's going to be problem dependent, for sure. Any anyone want to correct me or add to that? I think we don't understand the, the limits of what machine learning can do, and so I don't see a reason to see that you know these, these things are going to be more um, I don't know clever than us. Right? I think we we can uh, imagine that when I don't know that there is no reason for them not to. So I have a question that I, obviously this is a committee that's focused on, on geophysics, but um, there does seem to be, uh, the, the, the geophysics community is ahead of the game in terms of a variety of different applications on of, uh, computational applications than I would say a lot of the other parts of the earth sciences. And so what types of activities um, do you think we could support that might help, um, you know, improve the utilization of, of more complex computational methods to other parts of their sciences? What inroads do you see perhaps as, as fertile ground or low-hanging fruit for being able to do that? So, so that's a good prompt. I, I, I think getting, uh, so what something NSF could do would be to get uh, computer scientists who are potentially interested in new areas together with geoscientists where where these sort of methods are that are interested in these sort of methods and yet are under represented in, in current applications so just getting those two groups i don't know how you best do that in a workshop but but the geosciences have important problems that are interesting to data scientists are much more interesting than mining twitter or whatever they do with their time and and, and we just have to advertise those problems well and uh they my experience, make, at least with earthquakes, is that sorry, they don't. They, they will not make. I guess maybe not with those competitions. But mining Twitter can, you know, allow people to earn a lot of money. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, I think a big part of this is is the data, right? Um, this is taking off in seismology because we have tons of data, labeled data. We have lots of data-driven problems that are kind of well posed. Um, that's not so true for other areas of, of geosciences necessarily. So um, I think at the end of the day, that's going to control really where uh, where this gets adopted. Just, can I just add on this? Because so I talked with some of the data scientists and also like a computer scientist about like applying methods to different type of like a geophysics problem in seismology. But we found that like in seismology, like our data has its own format, and this format is designed actually not like the other type of area. For example, like in data science. People usually use JSON format or HDF5 and so on. So our own format is make us like a facilitate our analysis. We have our own tools used in the last few decades. So I think this is a, like a data data format actually creating creating a lot of barrier uh, at the first place because when I talk with the data data scientists, they usually complaining that. Uh, um, 
the seismology data is really complicated. And I told them it's not. If you download the SAC, you can actually run the, the SAC, SAC format, but they, they just like feel like this is too complicated. I, I guess a shameless plug here. Um, for the reference Earth model databases, they are being constructed in HDF to kind of facilitate uh, the use outside of the seismic community. And I think as our databases, the, re we, the reason we did that, even though it took us an extra year of work, is that it for very large databases, some of the uh, seismic uh, formats are not optimal. And so I think we as a community will move that way as we're kind of forced to. So I think we've come to the end of our session here, 4.30. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers, uh, especially all those of you that traveled here. And I want to mention, uh, before we give everyone a round of applause, I want to mention that uh, the, um, the video session from this will be online at the CUSD website. And with the permission of speakers, uh, slides will also be available soon on that website as well. So let's uh, give another round of applause and thank our speakers. And thank all of you for attending for a very stimulating session.